Well, we all know about the Great Commission, right? The Great Commission, go ye therefore into all the world, baptizing and, and, and teaching what, uh, what Jesus taught so that they would become believers. That's a, that is a responsibility and a job that really never ends for us. To bring people to Christ, uh, bring them to faith, teaching them to do all that Jesus commanded. Those are, that's the, that's the nuts and bolts of the Great Commission. And even as we gather together on Thanksgiving Day, we are, we are engaged in fulfilling the Great Commission. Anytime we are helping others um, obey Christ and to believe in Christ. And so we're never finished with that, that mission. And we do everything as, we, as, we, as, that, as our lives unfold. And, and even Thanksgiving and dinner will be part of that. And it's obvious as a pastor that my, my agenda is already set for me as a Christian pastor that I, my task is to, to call people to Christ, to help them uh, understand and to obey the Lord's commands. In a matter of days, we will all gather for Thanksgiving feast. And I want to talk about that this morning, about gathering for a dinner, because that is kind of the topic of the scripture from Luke chapter 14, 12 to 14. It was a Saturday. It wasn't typically, you know, our Thanksgivings are typically on a Thursday, but this was the Jewish Sabbath. And Jesus had been invited to a dinner by one of the leaders of the Pharisees, the most zealous and the, of the law keepers of the Jewish faith and tradition. And there's evidence that, that the, he was never invited back to that house again. How, how'd you like that? You ever been to a, a house, a, been to a home, and they invited you? They never invited you back. What did you do? How did you insult them? What did you... It seems like every time Jesus opened his mouth, or almost every time, he addressed somebody's hypocrisy. How would you like that for somebody who comes to your, uh, your Thanksgiving dinner and they, they like to point out, oh, the, the sweet potatoes are not sweet enough, the mashed potatoes are lumpy, the, the, what, what happened to the gravy? Where's the gravy? That could be very annoying, especially at, at a Thanksgiving dinner. But there was never another man whose mouth was so closely tied to the human heart as Jesus. Everything that Jesus spoke about, every word that came out of Jesus' mouth, it, it, touched, the alt, it, it touched the issues of the human soul. No man had ever spoken like Jesus. And that's what they said about him. No one has ever taught like that. They, people marveled at Jesus' teachings. And Jesus even said, For this reason I was born, that I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Are you, are you on the side of truth? Then Jesus must have your ear this morning. If you, if you believe in truth, objective truth, biblical truth, then Jesus has to... You need to listen to Jesus. So when Jesus spoke out at a Saturday dinner, and I'm not sure it was like a, a toast sort of, you know how you have toast at dinner? I went to, a, I just recently was at a wedding, and I saw people got up and gave speeches at the dinner. Some are quite interesting, I got to tell you. I was uh, surprised and shocked. Even the father of the bride was shaking his head and looking down and pacing. It was, it was quite humorous. I was watching him more than I was looking at the, at the, at the person speaking. But Jesus spoke at a Saturday dinner, and when we hear him through the Gospels, he created a division. Those who were on the side of truth, they listen and obey. And he actually said that. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. So, there's, so when Jesus speaks the word, there is an automatic division. It's like the kind of the parting of the Red Sea. Those, there's some on one side, and they listen and obey. Those who are not of the truth, they do not have the ears or the eyes to see. And Jesus says to them, my language is not clear to you because you are 
you are unable to hear what I say. He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear, a very, you know, very strong statement, the reason you do not hear, you do not listen, because you do not belong to God. Wow, that's a, that's a wake-up call there, isn't it? You've got to check yourself. If you, if, you, if, you, if you hear the word of God and you refuse to obey it, then you've got to check yourself and say, okay, do I, ask yourself the question, do I really, do, am I really God's? So let's take heed how we hear the words of Jesus, lest we, found, lest we be found to be indifferent. I don't know which is worse, being antagonistic to God's word or indifferent to God's word. That's, those are two, two things that we could struggle with. Some people say that antagonism is actually better because at least you're wrestling more with the word of God. If you're indifferent, then that almost means like you, you just don't even care. You're not even, you're not even trying to critically look at it. I pray that we will hear the, the word of the Lord today and we will prove that we will be among those who Jesus calls his own. F Jesus said, Father, I give them words. I have given them the words which you gave me. This is a, a prayer towards the end of the book of John. They have received them and I know the truth. And, and they know the truth that I, that I came from you. So, that, that's actually a prayer. Jesus is praying to his Father in heaven. He says, my disciples, those who believe in me, they have received the word and they, they know the truth. And, and that ultimate truth is what? That I came from the Father. I am the, the Holy One, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. So the first thing Jesus did on that dinner is heal a man. Perhaps he was laying outside the Pharisee's house as he entered. Not, not unlike when Lazarus, uh, remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus, and Lazarus kind of laid outside the gate of the rich man's house, but he was ignored, right? But Jesus did not ignore this person. He, he healed them, and it was on the Sabbath, which, you know, that stirs up a whole lot of things right there, right? Jesus asked, and Jesus asked the law experts, and he asked the Pharisees, if, if they thought the healing was lawful on the Sabbath. They did not answer that question, but their silence said everything, right? They, they, they were saying, no, that is, not, that is not lawful. As a matter of fact, in Luke chapter 13, uh, a chapter earlier, the synagogue ruler said, are there not six days to work? Come back on one of those days, not on the Sabbath, and maybe you'll get healed. So Jesus says here at the dinner, the same thing he said that he said in the synagogue, if one of you has a son or an ox, I think it's interesting how they take the, the son and kind of compare him with the ox. That means like the son, hey, hey, son, get out there and rake the leaves, or or do whatever, you know, kind of analogy there. But, but if he falls into the well, and God forbid anybody, my, my sons, I hope they would never fall into a well, but wouldn't you not, even if it was the Sabbath, would you not pull him out to, to rescue? And he asked that question, and, they, and they, again, they gave no answer. So Jesus leaves it for them, for us, and for them, and for us to draw the inference. Namely, you law experts, you Pharisees, you have a keen interest in your own welfare. And when your own welfare is at stake, you'll break the law to make sure you get what you want. But if, for some reason, the law becomes inconvenient, well, you'll protect your, your involvement. Here's the thing I think he's, Jesus is trying to say here is that we can be far from God even as we try to exercise our religiosity. We try to be religious somehow. We can be far from God, just like the Pharisees. 
Man, as a matter of fact, and a lot of people would agree, especially in the world, and I, gotta, I guess I have to agree to some extent, sometimes man can be at their worst when they're in the church, when they're exercising their religious freedom. Ha! Huh, that's an interesting thought, isn't it? But this is the first thing Jesus says when he comes to dinner. How do you like that? If your, your guest comes into dinner and you, and um, for example, maybe you say, uh, hey, would you mind taking off your shoes? No, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to, you know, trounce through your house with my shoes on, my muddy shoes. That would be really annoying. Jesus kind of got under their skin right away, but he did it out of love. He was trying to, he needed, he was trying to, well, he was loving them. Whether they're going to receive it or not, I don't know. The second thing Jesus did as he, as he came to dinner, he addressed the pride of the dinner guest. Right there in front of everybody. He has been sitting there watching them come in, and what does he look for? Does he look, does he, he takes it all in, right? He, he sees how they're dressed. He, he probably knows where they came from. He knows what jobs they're, they're involved in. And he looks for what they love. Because Jesus what does it say? Where, where your treasure, there is also your heart. And isn't it true? Jesus really wants our heart, right? He wants us to have a heart that's receptive, a heart that's generous, a heart that's well receptive to his truth and open to what he has to say. So Jesus watches and he sees, he looks at their heart and he sees their treasure and he sees that they love the praise of men, right? They, they love to be esteemed by occupying the best seats in the house. He watches them move in and out of conversations, uh, weaving their way to the best seats that they can have. Nobody fools Jesus. He is a master of every situation. And he basically says this to them. If your values don't change, you're in, you're in danger of hell. If your values don't change, you could be going to hell. Listen, he said that in two other places in the, in the scriptures, Luke chapter 11. Woe to you Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues, and, greet, and the, love the most, you like the greetings in the marketplace, where they come up to you and say, oh, you know... Good to see you today. Luke chapter 20. Be aware the teachers of the law, they like to walk around in their flowing robes, love to be greeted in the marketplaces, have the most important seats in the synagogues, and take places of honor at the banquets. Then he even gets even more graphic. They devour widows' houses, and for a show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely because their priorities are all messed up. Two things go hand in hand here. Exploitation of the weak and condemnation. If you do that, you're, going, you're condemned. It's, one, it's a math fact. You know, we go to, we try to, you have the equal sign, right? There's this, what's one side of the equal sign has got to equal to what's on the other side of the equal sign. If you exploit the weak, you are condemned. That's what Jesus is saying right there. And this is at the dinner party. Remember, he's, he is a guest. Usually when, you go, when you're a guest at a dinner party, you, you kind of mind your P's and Q's, and you, you take, take the cues from the host, and you... So Jesus basically says here, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and who, and who humbles himself will be exalted. If you perceive pursue the seats of honor on earth, you will have no seat at all in heaven. So you're, you're, you're basically cut off. You do not have eternal life. Well, I don't know about you, but I think he's ruffled some feathers at this, by this time in that people probably have lost their appetite even. I don't know about you, but I, don't you like anticipation? I mean, Something almost as good as the dinner itself is the anticipation of the dinner, right? The, to think about the, the cranberries and the turkey and the mashed potatoes and gravy and, and cream corn. And, and I like pickled beets too, by the way. If you get, anybody's got any extra pickled beets, I'll, you know, 
I'll take those off your hands, but. <laughs> Blake doesn't like pickle beets, okay. Oh, you do, oh, okay. Oh, okay, we got a, okay, a house divided over there, I see, okay. So what does he, first he, he exposes the legalist's ability to twist the law. Next he exposes the pride of those who crave the praise of men. And you think he's done, but he's not. He's, he's kind of getting warmed up because he says, he, now he, he was talking to the guests, now he goes right directly to the host. When you give a lunch or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, your rich neighbors, those you think are at the top of the list. So he's being... Um, He's thinking outside the box here. He's, th he's thinking contrary to what we typically think. When we think of a, don't we, don't when we have a dinner, we all of a sudden write down, okay, who is the top, who are the top people we're going to invite to our dinner? And he says, don't invite them because what? They might invite you back. That's, that, isn't that funny? We're kind of hoping for an invitation in return. No, instead, when you give a banquet, invite the crippled and the poor and the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed because, why? They cannot repay you. Your payment is not going to be an earthly payment. It's going to be a heavenly payment. You will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous, he says. You are doing a righteous thing by inviting those people who cannot repay you. He's being, being very counterintuitive here, isn't it? Danger, repayment ahead. Who, who, who would ever put that in a, in a commercial? You're, you might, that's bad, you're gonna get repaid. Everything is about being paid again, isn't it? About being repaid. Whatever you do, what am I gonna get back in return? This is how we live our lives in America, don't we? Who on earth talks like this? Only Jesus. He talks like this because he understands that his kingdom is not of this world. He talks like this because he understands that a thousand, a thousand years on this, on this earth is like, it's like a flash in the pan. He, he talks like this because he knows that um, in a moment our life vanishes. He talks like this because he's assured that if we have faith in him, we have, we have resurrection unto eternal life. No man ever spoke like Jesus. And we, as his followers, we cannot be ordinary either. We, if we're followers of Christ, we can't be ordinary. We have to be extraordinary because because we're followers of Christ. Now, I'm not saying here this morning you can't get together and have family reunions. You can't have, you can't have church suppers or you can't have Sunday school socials or things like that. But we got to perhaps sometimes shake up our traditions. As we get in, if we keep doing our traditions, sometimes we get in a rut. The truth is that in every human heart, and we, we got to look in the mirror and, 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 and agree with this, there's a very powerful temptation to live the law of earthly repayment, the law of what's called reciprocity, the I scratch your back, you scratch mine mentality. That's how life is usually played out. In, in general, in the world. Hey, what's in it for me? I'm going to do something for you. What are you going to do for me? Every Christian I know must battle every day with that tendency to, to, to try to always find the greatest earthly payoff. Whatever, whatever we're going to invest in, what is our, what is our, what is our return on the investment? You get mad when you go, oh, I, I just put a, I just had a CD and it's getting, you know, 1.5%. Darn it, that bank over there was, was going to give me 2.5%. I, I got to move the money over there.
I stress, I guess I stress the danger of living that way only because Jesus says it's dangerous. That's why I say it. But woe to you who are rich, you have already received your comfort. Jesus, Jesus uses the parable of, of, of Lazarus and the rich man kind of as a, as a, you know, as a teaching moment. You know the story, the rich man, he's, he's dressed in fine clothes, fine linen and purple clothes, and he lives in luxury every day, and there was a beggar named Lazarus who lay covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. And he had sores all over his bodies. And the only, the only thing that ever paid attention to the Lazarus was the dogs that could come. And... and then one day, the rich man, uh, the, the, the Lazarus died, excuse me, and he's carried to Abraham's side. And then the rich man also died, but he went to hell, Jesus says, and he was in torment. And, and the rich man begged, begged God and said, said would, would, can, can you send Lazarus to me so I can at least cool my tongue, have, dip his finger in cool water, and so I might have some relief from this agony and this fire. But he said, remember, you had the good things in, in your earthly life. And Lazarus, he received bad things. Now he is comforted, and you are in agony. And why, I guess the question is then today, why was it that the rich man totally ignored Lazarus? And it was Lazarus, and then it was what? Lazarus was in no position to repay the rich man. Whatever, whatever the rich man did for that poor man, no way Lazarus could repay him. And that's why the rich man never gave anything to Lazarus, because he knew he'd get nothing in return. So it says he went to hell. When you give a banquet, invite the poor, invite the crippled, invite the lame, because they cannot repay you. For if, for you will be repaid, your payment will come later. That's kind of like the layaway plan, right? You will be blessed because they cannot repay you. You will be blessed because they cannot repay you. When I was a single man, young single man, I didn't have a holly two dimes to scrape together and I was trying to get through seminary, there's people that always seemed to invite me to Thanksgiving. Not only that, they let me come over and raid the refrigerator later, later for the leftovers. They knew darn well I could not repay them. And that's what Jesus says. Sometimes we brace ourselves for some good old-fashioned self-denial. You know, it's like, what, what are we going to deny ourselves from this year? Or this week? Jesus turns that around and says, there, your self-denial will bring you great blessing. Your benevolence is not disinterested. In fact, it has great interest and it will be paid off in the, in the end times. It is more blessed to give than to receive. We've always heard that phrase, haven't we? It's right on the Bible. It's right in the Bible. If you lose your life in love for my sake, you will save it. So in the end, for those who obey, really, there is no self-sacrifice. And I know how it goes. I mean, we, we, we give and we give and we may, not get, we may not get a thanks. We mow somebody's lawn or we rake their leaves or we, we do something and they don't even acknowledge that we did that. And that kind of miffs us, I know. But we got to remember, our, our blessing, our payment is still to come. The reason it makes eternal difference about who you invite to dinner. And I'm not just talking about Thanksgiving dinner. I'm talking about it's a mindset, right? I mean, I'm not saying that all of a sudden, okay, this Thanksgiving, oh, I gotta find someone who's crippled or lame out there. No, I'm not saying that. It's a mindset. And the reason why it's important, it reveals 
where, where our treasure is, what our treasure is. Is God our treasure? Or is comfort and tradition and cherished routine, is that our treasure? Do you think maybe this season, not just Thanksgiving, but do you think we can, and I know we're doing, and I'm preaching to the choir here quite a bit, because I know you guys go out of your way to help have Christmas bo holiday boxes for certain families, and we do the giving tree and go out, go out of our way to buy clothing and other um, wish list items for people in the community. So I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, but... Inconvenience. Can we inconvenience ourselves for those who cannot repay? Will we do that or will we tend to avoid them so we can just preserve our cherished traditions? It does matter who we invite to Thanksgiving because, like I said, it, it, it tells us a lot about where our heart is and where our what our treasure is. I thank the Lord for reminding us of this today.